Estrogen stimulates mast cells to release histamine. This is why women have very cyclical histamine symptoms with their cycle, like migraines at ovulation or migraines before their period. Your family think you're crazy. The doctor thinks you're crazy. They'll try and give you an antidepressant and you're so sick. If you're really unwell and you've gone round and round in circles and you haven't had diagnosis with anything, I really want you to consider if you've got... Do you get bloating after you eat or itchy skin or you break out in hives or your energy levels absolutely tank or even get migraines during your period? If you're thinking, yep, that's me, well, that's just a very small list of possible symptoms for histamine intolerance, which can mean you find it hard to digest or you react to things like red meat, fermented foods like sauerkraut, alcohol, tomatoes, spinach, cheese, smoked fish, the list goes on. (laughs) Unfortunately, histamine intolerance is commonly misdiagnosed. And when it is discovered, the underlying causes are never treated or rarely even found. This is why on today's episode, we have a histamine expert who not only specializes in this with the patients that she sees, but she is also an educator for other medical and natural health professionals, specifically on histamine intolerance because it's quite complex and it's often masked by other health problems. So to learn a lot more about histamines, what they are, how to treat them, the underlying causes and how to treat those too, and of course, some of the problems that the industry that is creating for practitioners trying to work in this field, well, we've got to begin. So let's get into it. What's up, my healthy friends? Welcome back to another episode of this wonderful podcast. This year, it's my mission to coach 500 people to get control of their sugar cravings and sugar binges so they can stop yo-yo dieting, stop obsessing about food, and finally create a body that they feel confident being in. And the link to chat to us about our programs are down in the show notes and or the caption below wherever you are listening or watching to this show. So scroll down, click the link, and let's have a conversation. Okay, today, I'd like to introduce you to Joanne Kennedy, a very impressive naturopath and a specialist in histamine intolerance. MTHFR and methylation. Some of those things might a little be a little bit like, oh, what are they? I've heard of them, but I don't really know what they are. Well, just hold up a moment because that's where we're going to start. What are they? So Joe runs a successful clinical practice in Sydney, Australia. Nice to have a fellow Aussie here uh, and has a diary full of patients from all around the globe. And she is also the author of a book specifically about histamine intolerance, which is very much going to make up a bulk of our conversation today. So Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, so welcome. I'm very happy that Karen Martell, what a legend from Canada. She's been on here a few times. She connected us. It's always funny when people internationally connect fellow Australians. <laughs> no, she's so lovely, Karen. Like just, I love Canadians. Such a wealth of knowledge and such a warm, beautiful person. So I'm very grateful that she connected us. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I totally agree about Canadians. I've met a few people on the online health world from Canada. And I ended up staying with some friends that I met just through online health and wellness when I was sort of touring around the globe last year. So yeah, I share that sentiment. But I guess for us, histamines, what what exactly are histamines? Many people have heard about taking antihistamine medications or did when they were kids. I definitely remember getting those when I was a kid. So Mm -hmm. what are histamines and how do you become intolerant? Mm, Interesting. So histamine is officially a biogenic amine. So like, what does that mean? Biogenic means that it's made by all living organisms, including humans, animals, and plants. And an amine means it's made from an amino acid and the amino acid is histidine. So our body produces histamine. It's a really important part of our physiology, okay? So it's really an important part of our immune system. So it vasodilates capillaries, like widens them, to enable white blood cells and platelets to go to the site of injury to help repair, okay? It's involved in respiration, so breathing. It helps make hydrochloric acid in the stomach, which is really important for digesting our food. It's involved in contraction of smooth muscle, which is actually involved in labour, okay? So it's actually a really important part of pregnancy and labour. It stimulates estrogen to be produced, released from the ovaries. And it's actually also a neurotransmitter. And in the brain, it's involved in um, the sleep-wake cycle, in learning, in memory. It helps release serotonin and dopamine. Okay, so it's a normal part of our physiology. 
Okay. And we can build up too much histamine in the body, mainly from anything that's going to cause an inflammatory cascade in the, in the body. Okay. So histamine gets released when there's inflammation. Main causes of that are going to be gluten, gluten intolerance, digestive enzyme insufficiency, SIBO, candida, helicobacter pylori, celiac disease, irritable bowel disease, oxalates and mold. And estrogen can also increase histamine. So the body can start making a lot of histamine when you have these issues, these health issues. And at the same time, the enzyme, one of the main enzymes, the Dow enzyme, that breaks down histamine can just get overloaded with too much histamine. Okay. And then the net result is you have high histamine in your body. We sort of say it's histamine intolerance. And I think that real, the wording histamine intolerance comes from the fact that there are many foods that are high in histamine. And so when you, when your histamine bucket's already too high in your gut, you consume histamine foods and then you have, you're like, oh, I'm intolerant to to, to tomato, to avocado, to banana, to citrus. It's like that's sort of, I think, where the sort of intolerance terms come from. But it's essentially your body is making more histamine than it can break down. Yeah, right. And I guess what fundamentally causes it? Like, are people born with it? Do they go through life experiences? Or is it that expo- exposure to mold, exposure mm. to toxins? Yeah. Like, and I guess, can it be reversed? That's right. No, look. No, people. I think there are some people that potentially do have significant genetic mutations on some of the enzymes involved in histamine metabolism, but most of the time it's the environment that is going to stimulate too much histamine in the body, right? And it's just those things that I was mentioning, and they're very common things. It can also be it is environment, so it is the pollen, it is the dust mites, it is the dog hair, the cat hair. It is environment, it is, it's just trees and grass, all that stuff will release histamine from the body. And, but then, and then mold mycotoxins, environmental heavy metals will do it as well. People that get Lyme disease often end up with big issues with histamine. And then, Maddie, it's the common things we see in clinic every day, like if you, digestive enzyme insufficiency. If you don't have enough digestive enzymes, hydrochloric acid in particular, you don't break down your animal protein properly and it sits, rots, ferments in the gut. That can increase histamine. Right, SIBO, Mm -hmm. like SIBO bacteria, when you've got SIBO and a lot of gas being released, it causes a lot of inflammation in the small bowel. That inflammation will stimulate the release of histamine. Okay, and then we've got oxalates, which are sharp little crystals. They deposit in the gut. They get into the joints, into the, the bladder. They can get into the thyroid, into the brain. They can get anywhere, really. They cause a lot of inflammation, a lot of histamine to be released. Right. So there's actually many causes of high histamine and estrogen, really fascinating. Estrogen stimulates mast cells to release histamine. Okay. And then it's histamine also gets up in the brain and it gets, it increases the firing of the histaminergic neurons in the brain. Okay, this is why women have very cyclical histamine symptoms with their cycle, like migraines at ovulation or migraines before their period with the rise and fall of estrogen. So it's the common things that we're seeing in clinic every day that is driving up histamine in our patients, thereby it is extremely common. Out of curiosity, something that's just come up in my thoughts that I've never thought to look into, can you go the other way? Can you have histamine insufficiency? That's such a good question. Someone asked me that yesterday. No, I would say no. You can have a histidine, an amino acid deficiency of histidine. I have seen mm-hmm. that recently in patients that have, had, well, she's Canadian. She had low histidine and she's living in mold. She's almost MCAT. She's almost got SIRS. She's so high in histamine. That was interesting. Mm-hmm. But like, no, I will just say the thing with histamine is that it, it, a lot of the understanding of histamine is coming from the methylation world. This is, a bit com- this is a bit complex, right? Methylation breaks down histamine. So people will test whole blood histamine as a sign of methylation. Is your whole blood histamine high, right? Then you're not breaking down histamine properly. You're under methylating. Or is it low? You're breaking it down too much. Is it, are you over methylating? That's just very simplified and not actually really correct because the histamine is, methylation is one pathway of breaking down histamine. 
and then the Dow enzyme mm-hmm. is another. And really, the Dow enzyme is extracellular. So it's, you know, in the gut, extracellular in the gut. And when we're thinking about the majority of things that are causing high histamine, it's often coming from the gut, right? So I know it can get through to the bloodstream, et cetera, but clinically, and I've been working on this for 10 years, understanding if someone has a histamine problem is really signs and symptoms. As opposed to blood tests, functional path, that kind of stuff? Yeah. So you can have you can have a whole blood histamine test done and your histamine is completely in range, but you're, you have hives. Like it, you've got hives, you've got migraines, you've been living in mold, you've got chronic reflux and heartburn. Like plus you have the things that cause high histamine, like you have SIBO, you have mold, you've got estrogen dominance. That clinical picture is just this is a histamine bucket. Yeah. Right? So essentially they might be breaking, their methylation might be working okay to break down the histamine in the blood, but it doesn't mean that the histamine in the gut is not being necessarily processed properly. Mm -hmm. So it's just not a test that's completely accurate. Yeah, which is something we find with, I guess, lots of, Medical tests that show, yeah, one side of the conversation, unfortunately. But I, yeah, yeah. And I understand it's expensive to run a lot of those tests. Yeah, it's just not like, I mean, often, yeah, often it will look, Maddie, often it comes back high with people with high histamine. But I remember my, I had this patient when I first started, I didn't even know, honestly, didn't know about histamine. This is like when I was first started. And she was taking methylated B vitamin, methylated methyl Bs, and her histamine was really low at 0.3. And she had all these histamine symptoms. I didn't know what they were because she had irritability, anxiety, insomnia, and I didn't know it was histamine. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what you meant to do with someone like this is they're over-methylating, so you take them off the methyls. And then I did that and she actually felt worse and then came back to clinic where I was working, complained about me, rightly so. She went and saw another practitioner there, a friend of mine, and after that she came in and said, Joe, this is a histamine case, mm. right? So don't look at like over-methylation, under-methylation, pulling on or off methyls. It's like these are histamine symptoms, Right. She has SIBO, she's got oxalates, she's got mold, like all these things that are driving up histamine. So this is that was a really good lesson to me when I first started around whole blood histamine and you don't necessarily look at a low blood test of low histamine and think, oh, that person absolutely doesn't have a histamine problem because it's not the case. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it's funny, the, yeah, the problem patients or clients end up being our biggest teachers, right? <laughs> absolutely. You know, and this is why I've got a practitioner training course now because so many people have huge histamine symptoms, methylation problems, massive mold and oxide issues, and it's not picked up. And they go round and round in circles for years and years and years. They spend a fortune, they get sicker and sicker and sicker. And we need to be aware of it because it's really common. Like it's just, and I, it's just not, Matt, it's just not my, my, it's just not my take on things. Mm -hmm. It's, I'm training practitioners globally in America, Canada, Europe, and we're all seeing our patients have huge histamine problems. It makes sense. People, with, people that see us have chronic inflammation and that just drives up histamine. Yeah, and it makes sense in the modern world. Uh, totally. It's just, it is a modern world phenomenon, definitely. You know, and people are so much more reactive to environmental allergens because of gut dysbiosis and glyphosate and EMFs and stress and, you know, all this, all these things. So our immune systems become a bit wacky and overreact. This is like the real allergy picture. It's why people, you know, it's, and I'm not an allergy specialist, but it's like, why are people having so many allergic symptoms? And it's hard to treat those because it, you do need to remove yourself from the environment. Yeah. Especially with mold. Yeah, we're seeing more and more of it. And I can imagine, you know, with the increase in medications we take in, with the disconnection from putting bare feet on the ground and, you know, connecting with microbiomes or, you know, microbiota that are not necessarily our own more often, 
that, yeah, we're just going to see more of these reactionary bodies and inflammatory bodies, plus, of course, the obvious one of putting you know, vegetable oils and sugar and copious amounts of additives and preservatives into our gut, which dysregulates, mm. it creates that dysbiosis. It's, yeah, it feels hard to tackle when it's yeah. like, oh, just move to it another does. country and, you know, hug the trees. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, I know. I've, it's really hard. Like, I mean, it's, I've got patients that, you know, go and live in more desert areas or in sort of islands in Europe, like Malta is so very, it's just an island with all built up mm-hmm. buildings and their allergies just go away. But they come back here with all our plant life and they're just reactive to it. Yeah. But it's like, why? So histamine can be challenging to deal with when it's the environment. However, as I was saying before, it's not always environment. It's often the things, it's like the gut dysbiosis and the diet, the lifestyle stuff that we can really improve with our patients. Yeah. Well, I guess going into that a little bit with the Dow enzyme, like the diamine oxidase, being produced Mm -hmm. by the bacteria in the gut, I guess that leads me to a sort of an obvious conclusion of, most Western eaters and drinkers have leaky gut, right? Um, or some form of dysbiosis mm. in their gut. Yeah. And so, so how, yeah. how much is it a part of the picture to heal that leaky gut? And what happens oh, yeah, next? Definitely. Is that sort of a heal the leaky gut, produce the Dow enzyme a bit more naturally without having to supplement, and then histamine is managed mostly? Yeah, so interesting. So Dow enzyme made in the cells, they reside in the microvilli of the gut. Mm-hmm. And one of their roles is to prevent too much histamine getting through in the bloodstream. So you're like, okay, what if I've got dysbiosis and inflammation? I'm not producing enough Dow as well. Like I'm making all this histamine, I'm not producing enough Dow. That's definitely going to allow for more histamine to get through into the bloodstream. And then the environment that's causing that, the dysbiotic environment and like eating gluten you know, glyphosate, herbicides, pesticides, toxins causing a leaky gut, right? And therefore you're going to have a lot of systemic histamine symptoms, Mm -hmm. okay? So the and you notice it when you consume foods, your skin gets worse, you know, then gut-brain access issues, your neurological histamine issues can get worse. So it's how I look at this is, I'm, I'm, I never test for leaky gut. I don't even mention it to my patients. It's like in the back of my, my, my mind. I'm like, oh, yeah, for sure you've got leaky gut. But what we do is we fix the cause first, yeah? Yeah. So we get the gluten out. We fix the SIBO. You know, the thing with SIBO, FODMAP foods, which are so good for creating short-chain fatty acids in the large intestine, which is a fuel source for the cells of the gut to replenish and repair consistently, they're not getting down to the large intestine because they're being fermented in the small bowel, right? So it's like we, we go in and we just get the digestion working, get the SIBO under control, prebiotics to help feed the microbiome, and then this, the gut will slowly repair itself. It, it, is that sort of how I work? Because, you know, for numerous reasons, I just think you, it's for me, I'm always trying to fix the root cause. And I believe that if you, remove what's causing the leaky gut, it will start to heal. Do you feel that with patients that you see, are they suffering to the point that they're willing to make dramatic change? Or do you find that they still battle with fully removing some of the causing, the contributing factors like, you know, I can't break up with the chocolate, you know, or the wine or the cheese and crackers, you know, is that one of the battles that you see clients, patients have? Definitely. I have, I would say, especially when I was working in the city, Maddie, I would have my city folk who were, you know, some gut issues, SIBO, maybe stress, whatever. And a lot of them, yeah, they do find it hard to give up the alcohol and the chocolates and the sweet treats, after, you know, after lunch. And it's true. These people have niggling health issues. And I get it because I get the same. It's really hard to give up your cheese and wine just for a niggly health issue. Yeah. My other patient base are chronically ill and they will do whatever it takes to try and get better. So it's a bucket. And look, you know, I should say SIBO, although not serious, makes people feel terrible because it causes this massive inflammation and histamine and it's bloating and like low iron, low B12, and you can feel really bad from it. So 
if people have, uh, if people feel unwell enough, then they're willing to change. And like, I do have people come back to me two years later saying, Joe, I'm ready now. I just wasn't ready before. Mm. Yeah. I needed two more years of suffering. <laughs> but people have life. People are going through, you know, they but also they've got SIBO because they're in a really stressful job and they need to get out yeah. of that job or they're having, they're going through a divorce. People have yeah. all different things that are going to hinder them doing what's required. And look, the thing with what I do, it's not a passive thing. Like you've got to get on board and do the work. It's not like going to the yeah. acupuncturist who can lay there and like get all zened out with needles. <laughs> it's like yeah. you've got to, it's so, it's hard. Like it is, it's like you got to get on board, you got to do the thing. But, you know, I will put, you know, when I really think some people, I can understand they're in a position where it's really hard for them at that time. And I'll just sort of, we just sort of chat about that. When I've got someone who's sort of arming an hour and, and doing a bit of a winch, right? I'm like, I'll go hard. And I'm like, you can do it. You don't have any hindrances to treatment. Let's go for it. And usually they get on board. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm curious in this sort of fast paced world <laughs> of, you know, Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and, you know, the social media world where you get snippets of stuff and not the full story, which is why I like podcasts because we can do a bit more of the full story. But is, are there any wellness trends or fads or things that you have seen? that have popped up in this world of maybe gut health or a histamine intolerance specifically that is just worsening the problem for people and that really frustrates you as a sort of really you know, intelligent practitioner. You're like, why is this wellness trend kicking off? It's just con- like contributing to the problem. Ah, oh, yeah. I mean, these are wellness trends that have been around forever, a long, long time. Juicing smooth, like juicing grain, grain juices, you know, super hot. Okay, I'm just going to, everyone's going to put spinach in there, right? Super mm-hmm. high oxalate, super high histamine. Okay. Then we have like maca, right? So maca is so estrogenic. It's for menopausal women. I've got young women who will just put maca in their smoothies and end up breakthrough bleeding on the pill, massive acne, huge bloating, big booze, really bad hormone issues. You know, fermented foods, like they're so high in histamine. I don't actually even know how it, this movement got off the ground because people that are looking to heal their gut usually have big histamine issues and they go overboard with fermented foods and it, mm. they can, it is histamine. Like so they consume and they get worse and worse and worse. Yeah, so there's definitely a, and the whole plant-based movement, like that's just not good for a lot of people. It's just any like even things that are quite with a lot of research and that are very efficacious for certain people like keto. Keto is amazing for, you know, for weight loss and brain function. It's designed for epilepsy, isn't it, and reducing inflammation. Yeah. But, you know, keto can be so high in fat and if you, have, if you end up with too much fat in your gut, it can cause oxalate problems. Or intermittent fasting for perimenopausal women, it can make you really anxious, which is really bad for your hormones. So there are just a lot of, so there are the fads like the green juicing and like going hardcore and maca powder and stuff like that. And then mm-hmm. there are really robust researched dietary interventions for certain conditions and popular and people that are not done at the right time in your life. So many things that we see, and it's really confusing for people because they can be getting it from a reputable source. You know, keto, like intermittent fasting is a classic. Like it, I understand how great it is for weight loss and reducing your inflammatory markers, but it really can put stress on the adrenals, release cortisol, disrupt women's hormones, make them hormonally imbalanced, make them extremely anxious. Mm-hmm. And during perimenopause, that's not a great time to do it. Some women can. They're just robust. And I don't see them, <laughs> but I see a lot of women that come to me from doing that and we've got to get their cycles back in track, on track and, you know, get help their mood. So it, it, it's it, nutritional medicine, is, and you know this, is powerful, powerful medicine. And I think because we we all eat three meals a day that we think, oh, we can just get, we just get it and that we can, yeah. we can actually manage this ourselves. We, if we listen, if we get some good information, but you sort of, you it's like you need a full health check from a very competent pra- health check from a competent practitioner to say green light, red light. Is this is yeah. what you should be doing right now? 
Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think that, and there's, I think there's another one to that. It's one, you need to be sitting in front of somebody who knows how to use the nutrition as medicine or, you know, as a healing agent. But the other thing is, and, and I think this is really common when we talk about food as medicine, there's this lack of taking it seriously. So some people will say, yeah, uh, let's say you spinach for just the example, because you mentioned it before, but let's say the prescription is spinach every day uh, or three times a day. And they'll be like, I had it twice last week. Why didn't it change anything? <laughs> and I think that's because we just have this relationship with food that it's not that powerful. It's not that serious. When we think about it in comparison to the word medicine, we think pills and we think three times a day and antibiotics. And, and so mm. I, think, I think, yeah, we've got to, I don't know, convey in some way the importance of treating the food like taking the, the antibiotic three times a day that you once took yeah. from the doctor that, that ruined your gut and caused the dysbiosis. Anyway, rabbit hole. <laughs> No, I, to- I totally agree with you. It's just crazy powerful. I'm always surprised at how powerful it is. I'm always surprised at how powerful herbal, med- herbal medicine is. It still blows my mind. So it's powerful. It can, it, you know, I just use oxalates as an example. Oxalates deplete the body of sulfur. Like that causes issues with making glutathione and the liver detoxification of sulfation, just to name two things. You do, you can that's your biochemistry. You can have an immense impact on your biochemistry from dealing with an oxide problem in a beneficial way. You, yeah. know, you know, so it's, it's really, really powerful. And people who have gone down this journey will attest to how powerful and healing it really, really can be and how detrimental it can be when done wrong. Really, I've seen people do it, you know, like the oxalates are very hard to deal with. And when people have gone hardcore on high oxalates, like juicing spinach, you, it is a very hard thing to unravel. So it's like too much of one, too much, that old saying, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess with that same <laughs> idea that you just mentioned there, too much of a good thing. What are, you mentioned intermittent fasting in the context of healing the gut and you know, re-regulating the species that are in the gut and bringing back the Tao enzyme. Is fasting, like sort of longer term fasting beneficial or is it just too risky for your, the patient population that you see? I'm going to have to answer this in two ways. I have patients that can't eat anything. No, seriously. Mm. They, they can't eat anything. They, they can't. They, they, have, they react to everything, right? Yeah. So sometimes, yeah, let's just say so sometimes... It's just such we're trying. All we're trying to do is reintroduce, get them to eat some things. Because I know I've got a lot of people who listen to this stuff, and it's like, yeah, it's all right for you. Can't eat anything. So we're trying to like reintroduce foods back in. But with right. regards to fasting, you know, for instance, you know, SIBO does very well on fasting because it allows the migrating motor complex to kick back in. Okay, mm-hmm. so if you don't eat, your migrating motor complex has time to sweep out undigested food, bad bacteria. Okay, but I wouldn't be doing. I I wouldn't. I'm not into like doing fasting for two three days, and also because I'm trying to. I'm just trying to watch for symptoms. I'm like, I need to know that you are like digesting your food now properly. That your bowels are moving. You know that you are tolerating these foods. So I don't really work with fasting because I'm more interested in making sure that we're. Three meals a day, this on general, three meals a day, time in between meals to get the migrating motor complex working, balancing your blood sugar, getting you to eat in routine, getting you to take your supplements in routine, chewing your food, eating mindfully. If you don't eat, you don't poop. That's just my take on it. However, some people, yes, it's not to say that doing some fasting won't help kick in the migrating motor complex, but it's like why, why is it hindered in the first place? So I'm just constantly trying to work with, I'm more interested in gathering data from my patients, right? Like if you don't eat, you're not going to feel bad. Does that make sense? (laughs) A lot of people feel so much better when they don't, they don't feel so much better when they don't eat. I'm like, well, what am I going to do with that? Like, because when you start eating again, you're going to feel bad again. Like I don't, I'm like, clinically I'm like, you're not giving me any data because <laughs> someone Understand. will say, oh, Joe, like I ate that red meat. I, I, I ate the red meat and I just blah, blah, bloated and I got a histamine reaction from like you really need hydrochloric acid because you haven't, your sink's low and you're really stressed. So it just, it just doesn't give me enough data. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure you're going to feel amazing, but 
you can't not eat forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm not really into, I'm just, just not how I work. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. Uh, yeah, I fully understand it. I'm curious, how did you get into this? Like what led to you being interested in this world? Like what was the trigger or the situation that was it your own health or just sort of clinical curiosity? Such an interesting question. And I don't have a health history story. My story is a bit weird. Mine was just out of necessity of getting out of corporate <laughs> because I was working in corporate and I just go from one industry to the next. And I really was always a fish out of water there. Mm-hmm. Just not into it. And look, you know, I was always, I come from a really foodie family, We're always food obsessed, like all of us, all our cousins and everything. And we're sort of interested in food. And I was always like, healthy eating and always interested like what's that person eating for lunch is that healthy like just I know that I was always interested and I just I was just lost I was I didn't want to didn't know what I wanted to do I started doing yoga right I said to myself by the time you're 30 you're going to start doing yoga because that'll be really good for you like long term and I met an Indian girl from Mumbai like full yogi and she just took me under wing and she's, I went to her house and practiced yoga every day and her husband used to make us chai and it was real so nice. And she's like, Joe, you're like holding onto the, your mat like you're going to fall off, like you're really highly strong. And she's like, you need to eat grounding, warm foods. I'm like, that's interesting. And then she started talking to me about all this stuff. I'm like, what is this? And she's this Ayurvedic medicine. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, oh, it's so interesting, Ayurveda, and I'm so into like spirituality and yoga. I'm like, I'm going to go do a course. And so I went to Nature Care. They were running a short course on Ayurveda for like six weeks. And I was, this is just one of those poignant moments in life where I was so lucky there was a careers advisor that took my little six-week course and me really seriously. And she said, if you're really interested in this, Ayurvedic medicine, are you really going to go to India and study eight years and get right into the philosophy? and live like a Hindi and wear a turban and whatever. I'm I'm like, no. And she's like, why don't you do Western nutritional medicine? And then, and it's true, you could go and do a Western nutritional degree and then add Ayurvedic philosophy in in the mix if you wanted to. Yeah. Right? You can do, or you could add Reiki in the mix. Anything, it's great, right? And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start this massive, expensive, long degree. (laughs) I just decided. (laughs) <laughs> I went from not to, I went, it was like within a week, my family were like, okay, that's good. And then I never looked, honestly, I just never looked back and I just found it fascinating, loved it. And then within six months of being at Nature Care, I was sort of started, uh, I went to the student clinic, just they needed bodies to help, you know, for clinic hours and didn't have many health issues. I'm like, oh, I'm always a bit highly strong. They're like, take withania, ashwagandha. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. So I took herbs for the first time in my life. I'm like, oh, my God, this is so great. I feel so chilled out. I'm like, herbal medicine's fascinating. And so I just jumped into naturopathy and studied herbal medicine and then was really fortunate when I graduated. I mean, when I was studying, and this is for any student that's studying at the moment, it's just I know it's such a big degree, but when you can in your holidays, you've got to do further education on SIBO, on oxalates, on methylation, right? There's lots of platforms that are offering this stuff because this is where it's at. And then I had done a lot of that stuff. And then when Carolyn Adowski opened MTHFR support, she was looking for practitioners and I was kind of there ready because I'd kind of done Ben Lynch's courses on methylation and I was like really geeking out on that stuff and I was interested and was following what she was doing so it was a timing thing whereby I was she was looking for someone but I was really prepared so I was ready to go and then I just jumped in with her and learned so much and never looked back so this just that was a journey and it was just my own kind of personal journey and it's definitely my dharma my life path and it came out of necessity of hating corporate but I think it's, I think a lot of people like corporate and are looking for something else to do. And I think our industry is wonderful. And if you put the effort and work in, there is a massive market for it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. I love that. It's interesting to hear people's stories because <laughs> so many people in this world came from a complex health background for themselves. And I think yeah. like yes. I didn't either. So a lot of people you know, ask me what's going on with my health. And I didn't really, there was some little stuff along the way, like there is for all of us, but nothing major that was like, oh, my life's purpose is to yeah. solve this disease or whatever it might be. So um, no, I think that's, I think it's awesome that you're here. And I think 
the thing too that yeah. is nice when we have conversations, especially publicly like this with people like you, is that it, it really brings legitimacy to the natural side of medicine because, you know, there's still a big portion of people out there that think it's a bit woo and it's a bit whatever. But it's like you said, Western natural medicine is so heavily scientific now. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is a rabbit hole conversation for another day. But for the average consumer, that's mm. a really good thing for them to trust it. I to- totally agree. So this, there, what we now have is the scientific world creating functional medicine testing that we have access to that we can use, always with an open mind. But we have this testing available and we have proven, so like we have researched and proven applications and clinical protocols to help with so many of these issues and their research there is so much research histamines i think one of the most researched molecules in medical science why because they're looking at the drugs because there's like five there's five or six histamine receptors they can block those receptors how perfect right but there's always side effects and you're not getting to the root cause so when it comes to histamine there is so much research and the thing is it takes so long. This is the problem. And it is massive in allopathic medicine, something like 17 years for some like latest research to get into the doctor's hands, like crazy yeah. stuff. I've been working with medical researchers that have told me this, right? And then with regards to naturopathic colleges, universities, they have to create a whole curriculum and get the tech. They need the textbooks and that structure for education. They can't just go and look at like Sally Norton stuff all on oxalate, which is groundbreaking and amazing and all the information on low histamine, there's hardly any research on it. There's just anecdotal evidence from people like myself, uh, uh, Dr. Shoemaker in the United States, a mold specialist, just people that are looking at this stuff day in, day out that are like have so much data and in the labs like Great Plains, now Mosaic Labs, have so much data on oxalates and mold and, and candida in the garden and the associations with it. This mm-hmm. stuff is not going to get into universities and colleges. It's just, it's not going to get there because it's, they have to create, this is how I see it, they have to create a really structured curriculum. And rightly so, they are teaching people to research and understand and like any degree, you really need that. You need to understand statistics and p-value, p-values, oh my God. Remember those? <laughs> all of that stuff, all that hard stuff, you... <laughs> Like what? Do you I just like you're probably good at it. I was like, what? So yes, because we need to have the structured education to have people understand how to research and think. Because I have worked with practitioners that didn't go to a good college or university and they can't read research and they don't know. So it's a problem and the problem comes down to the fact there's a few other problems in our industry that whereby you graduate. There's no job for you, really. It's like yeah. Yeah, there's no lovely little job. I remember when I first, you don't just go into your like office at Westpac and sit there and get a wage and get a boss and security and all that superannuation and all of that. You have to go out and get your own clients. And a lot of people will struggle with that and then they'll start and they'll see one or two a week and then, I don't know, you know, it's true. They go and have a they lo- be- lovely. They'll go and have a baby, and then they take the, f- the foot off the pedal for several years, and then just never come back to it. So there's mm. just our industry is very. There's a lot of different practitioners that are doing different things, and so it, it's just an industry whereby there's just there's so many reasons whereby the best clinical applications don't get into the hands of the actual patient. It's just the way it is, and it's a shame. Does that make sense? It it's not like everyone that comes out of naturopathic college gets a job and gets to see patients three or four days a week, sees 35 patients a week and learns, gets mentoring, mm. is has access to the testing, has patients willing to do the testing, has patients the money to do the testing because essentially it is a business and so you have to have practitioners that have a business acronym, the time, the money, the business brain, the marketing brain to get a business up and running to be able to treat histamine, to be able to treat oxalates, to be able to treat methylation. That's just the way it is. And so what happens is that patients go, 
I see this all the time. This is one of the worst things I see. They'll, they'll go, go to a practitioner. They're sent off for so much testing, thousands of dollars of testing. They'll do genetic testing, Dutch hormone testing, stool testing, SIBO testing, or, uh, organic acids. And the practitioner will just go, oh, like you've got dysbiosis. We'll give you some herbs and probiotics. Where, and they're full of oxalates, which is the most detrimental thing in my mind to start with. And it's ignored. I can't tell you how many organic acids tests I've seen with high oxalates, which destroy people, basically makes them so sick. And the practitioners don't know about it. They, they are not trained on it. It's a massive problem in our industry. And people are, I had a girl yesterday, last, last, on Monday, so sick. She's living a German girl. She's living in Bali. She's traveled the world trying to get help. Her, all her three oxalate markers are through the roof. She's making them endogenously. She's got them in her gut. She's so, so, so sick. She did that test five years ago, Maddie, and no one has picked up. That's a big problem. And it's yeah, well. really bad, right? So this is what's happening. It's, and it's just like, I don't know. I'm not saying I've got all the answers, but I, because I didn't have children, I was obsessed with working. I needed to work for my own money and to establish my own business that I just went all in and saw, four, and saw eight patients a day, four days a week and learned and had amazing mentors, right? But other people's journey is different. And so this is a problem in our industry. And then the government don't support us. They cut all the private medical, they cut all the private medical rebates for people. The testing's expensive. Supplements are expensive. I get it, right? But I think this is why I've created the practitioner training course because I want practitioners, I've had a lot of people just come straight out of uni do it because it gives them the confidence to say, no, you don't need to do a stool test. You need to do organic acids. Like this is what you, this is where you need to spend your money. And I promise you, this is money well spent because we're going to find something. You've got all the signs and symptoms and we can help you. Because I also see a lot of practitioners as well on the other side, not testing enough because they don't, they're scared to ask the patients to spend the money. Right. But knowing what tests to do and knowing for sh- like I can help you if you do these tests, I'm confident that I can help you is what we need in our industry. We, we, we really do. And I'm in, I tell you what, when I'm stumped, when I really don't know, people don't get much testing and I really hate that because I don't know. But if I'm 90% sure, I could get them to go off and do organic acid, SIBO, stool testing and go, I'm just you get these tests done and we'll be able to help you. So, yeah, so sorry for my rant. <laughs> but, but <laughs> I loved it, it. it. That's the problem. It, it's good because the problem is the research is there and people don't think that it is, but it's like this is the thing. The research is there. How do you put it into clinical practice and protocols and how do you get the people the testing and get it all done and it's, it has to be, it's a business. You, you need to be able to do that for people. Does that make sense? Yeah. You need to have the, the foundations in place to create that space for people to heal. Get the right testing. Get the supplements in from America if you need to. Does that make sense? So, so it's like, there is, and, and also there is the research, but we need to take that research and create clinical protocols. And we need, we need to have seen, you know, it is true. It's like anything. You need to have seen a lot of patients and you need to have seen those protocols work. And you need to tweak them where necessary and learn. I think one of the issues with the whole natural medicine education system is that we get one subject, which is business, and it's terrible because, yeah, like you said at the beginning there, one of the things they don't tell everybody, you know, you've got a mix of generally, I was pretty much the only male in most of my classes. You've generally got middle aged women whose kids have left home or who had sick kids and they're like, I need to figure this out. Or you've got 19 year old. 19 year old girls that mm-hmm. are like, you know, you know, following the right people online. So you've got these two groups of people, neither of which are from business families generally, or have that naturally within them. Mm-hmm. And I would say mm-hmm. me included, I w- I'm from a very blue collar countryside Aussie family. And they don't tell you one subject at uni learning business and how to put things into protocols. It's not enough. And then you end up with all of these naturopaths and nutritionists and TCMs that are seeing one, maybe two clients a week. And it's like for a long period of time and, you know, it's not their fault, but it's like, how can you develop the, in, like the insight or the, the intuition to be able to read results or read people if you're not seeing a high enough 
you know, a number of people. And then you've got to be a marketing expert. And then you've yeah. got to be a, 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 able want. to sell, you know, and it's like you need to do four different degrees. And unless you've got the resilience to be able to not sleep, which is the strategy that I used, is basically there was a solid few years where it was like day job, <laughs> you know, and then study. And then, you know, like the I, yeah. I edited the first 80 episodes of this podcast at about 2 a.m. before they came out at 5 a.m., wow. you know, the day that they Good happened. Yeah, I, but that and that's the sacrifice. And I did. I've spent about you know, almost a hundred thousand dollars now over about seven years on different business coaches, some which failed and earned no money back, zero dollars back. You know, and it's a lot. They yeah, don't tell you of all yeah. of that stuff. You know. No, it's not, Mandy. This is such a good conversation because I just want people need to pay. I think the general public need to understand that this is the situ- This is the situation in our industry. And that there is why you might not be getting a good result. And it's not because it's not efficacious. It's not because it's not yeah. good research. It's not that it's not powerful. You're just not getting the right help. And then for people wanting to study and get into naturopathic medicine and nutritional medicine, if you have a calling for it and you love it, go all in. You have to sacrifice but you have to work really hard. You've got to go the extra mile. You have to get good at marketing. You've got to get business coaching, all of that. And if I, I think if you're not willing to do it, it's not right for you. But if you are, then there's, there's amazing rewards. It's such a rewarding job and you can help so many people and it's people are in desperate need of good naturopaths and good nutritionists, desperate globally. I totally agree. So it's exciting. It's a really exciting industry to be in, but it's like you, you got to just be like, right, I'm going all in. And, I was, you know, honestly, like even with social media and stuff, we were talking about this before the show, I just remember like Instagram and YouTube, I'm like I didn't even really know what it was. I was like, what is it? I remember the first you, uh, Instagram post I did of myself in a video and I just remember saying to myself, get over yourself. <laughs> Who cares? No one cares except the person with a histamine problem. And no one is looking at you, Joe, except the person with the histamine problem will be like, oh, no, I think I've got that. And then you just do reels, start and just do videos and get out there and like go to gyms and start talking, go to yoga studios and start talking and just you've got to hustle and get out there. And then you can succeed, but you have to as, Maddie, you've obviously worked really hard. I've worked extremely hard as well. But the benefits are immense and like the the opportunity to be an amazing naturopath is it's there because there's training you can do I mean I've got an amazing course, you can do mold courses, like Sandip Gupta's done a mold course, you can go and do methylation courses, SIBO courses, neurology Kobe SIBO courses, awesome. So many courses that you can do outside of study to get you up to and you can make a difference in people's lives. So I just want people to know, like the re- like, and if you're interested in studying naturopathic medicine, there is so much research and it's very powerful. And if you've had a bad experience with a naturopath nutritionist, it just hasn't been right for you. They've missed something. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. Good advice. I really like that. Also, I want to add there, and this is the all the business <laughs> coaches in the back of my head. I'm also going to want to say to those people listening to that point specifically is don't get stuck on the hamster wheel of education because you can educate yourself to death before you feel confident enough or believe in yourself enough to actually get out there and do. And half of it's education and half of it's sitting in front of real people. Oh, absolutely. hundred percent, hundred percent. I have an amazing girl that tra- did my course. She was a nurse. So she's got the professional indemnity insurance and stuff. And she's halfway through her degree. She's in a country town. People have terrible diets in a mining town or whatever. And there's lots of new moms. She just went for it. She just started like treating them and giving them nutritional advice. And then she did my histamine methylation course, which is complex. And she was right there. She does my mentoring. She's just amazing. And she's only a young girl, but she's like, I want to help people. And I'm going to start now. I'm not going to wait till I finish my degree. She does have, she was a nurse, so she could get the right insurance. And she is providing good advice to people, nothing crazy right? But she's starting to see people. And that's the thing you need to just start. You you need to start seeing people and getting bums on seats and seeing how your results work. Yeah, it's really true. 
And whilst you're studying, it is, by the time I finished my degree, I remember sitting in lectures, not going, just think, thinking, can't wait to get home and do Ben Lynch's methylation course online. I can't wait to do <laughs> um, Narala's Jacoby SIBO course. And I really, at the end of my degree, this is true, I was not getting the marks I used to because I wasn't looking at their curriculum like I was looking at this stuff that I now know and that I know in clinical practice is what you need to know. Does that make sense? I was just like, this is what makes sense. If we go over cardiovascular disease and the Mediterranean diet again, I'm going to die. And I was just like, they're (laughs) they're behind. It was just like, they're behind. It's the same thing. It's just like, no, and like adapted adre- adrenal herbs and stuff. And just so, what, it's just not right. It was just, now I look back on it and so much of it is not right. So it's not about your marks. It's about your enthusiasm. It's about getting out there and understanding what's going on with, like, what are the, they're not, what are the new things that, we're, that practitioners are looking at that are the main causes of ill health in our patient base? And I really think for gut, mm. it's like SIBO is such a big thing. Like it, the thing with, yeah. I mean, I for, definitely for histamine, SIBO causes large bowel dysbiosis is not a big problem for histamine. Yes, there's research that there are histamine producing bacteria, Klebsiella, Citrobacter being two of them. But clinically, if you just try and balance that out in the gut, kill off those guys, it doesn't correlate with, it doesn't correlate with getting your histamines down. It's coming from usually from SIBO and digestive enzyme problems. But, yeah, you just, until you start seeing patients, you don't start seeing patterns. Absolutely. And so I guess because everybody's at this point, if they're still hanging out with us, they're like, Joe's amazing. Where can they find you on the internet? Where are we sending people to get into your world? Yes. So my website is joannekennedynatropathy.com. So on there, you can book consults with myself globally. I also have an e-bundle, which is just an e-book. It's like 90 pages. It's very well researched with uh, um, some video, like short videos. So it's like, there's like 32 little short snippet videos. It's not too overwhelming for people. So I've got my little histamine e-bundle. Also, I've got my, the information on my practitioner training course, which will be launched again next year, but I'm currently open for application. So if you're a practitioner or student, you're interested, it's a very simple application form you just need to fill in. If you are into YouTube, it's just Joanne Kennedy Naturopath. I have a lot of YouTube, educational YouTube videos. Some of them are quite long. If you want to geek out on methylation pathways, you can go and do that on there. And then on Instagram, I've got, it's just Joanne Kennedy Naturopath. Fantastic. So it's just my name really. (laughs) Yeah. I'll put all of those links down in the caption show note below so we can get some people over into your world. And for us to round out today's conversation, what is one piece of health information that you wish more people knew about? I'm going to have to say this because it's just on my radar at the moment. If you are, if you're really unwell and you've gone round and round in circles and you haven't had diagnosis with anything, I really want you to consider if you've got issues with mold. Okay. If you have lived in mold, if you have a living in a house with water damage and you have chronic, inf- can I just say the symptoms, Maddie? I know this yeah. is waffling. If you have neurological histamine, if you have headaches, migraines, vertigo, insomnia, if you've got itchy skin, hives, eczema, if you've got chronic fatigue, if you've got fibromyalgia, chronic pain, all of these chronic pain, chronic fatigue symptoms that no one can diagnose, so often it is going to be a mold and oxalate patient a condition and it will go missed forever because people aren't picking it up, but it is, it is so prevalent. It's Sydney's really bad with mold. I see a lot of Americans, Florida, terrible Pacific Northwest, that Europe, cold Europe. We are seeing patients like this every day, man, who've had these problems like 10 years and they're honestly so sick and it's mold and it, you'll get gaslit. Mold's not a problem. Mm. You know, your family think you're crazy. The doctor thinks you're crazy. They'll try and give you an antidepressant and you're so sick. I just want people to understand that it's a real thing. There is so much research on it. We've got testing for it. We've got treatment protocols for it. And so if that, if you're at your wit's end and you don't know, just have a real think whether you've had exposure to mold, if you can see it, or if, if even if you lived in mold before, because it can get into your body. And if you are currently living like with water damage, because it, and some people are genetically, they have genetic issues where they can't detoxify mold properly. 
So amazing. That's just what I, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I appreciate your time. And thanks for being here and sharing your wisdom with the world. And yeah, hopefully we can have you back again in the future because I think people are going to love you. And otherwise, we'll catch you on the next episode. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Maddie.